Hi everyone, my name is Angela and welcome to my YouTube channel. I love to buy books. I read somewhere recently that buying books can be similar to buying wine for a wine cellar. You may not buy a book to read right now, but you buy it to just sit on the shelf and just age nicely until you are ready to read it. And that's kind of my approach to a lot of books. I love to have a selection on my shelf that I can just pick up at any time. And, and over the last few months, I've been buying books, uh, you know, as you go about daily life, coming across bookstores here and there. We had a couple of weekends away where I visited some bookstores. Today, I'm gonna to share them with you. I didn't realize how many I actually had, but I have 17 books to share with you. And these are a mix of memoir, anthology, fiction, non-fiction, new releases, classics. It is quite a mixed bag. So let's get into it. You know I am a sucker for a cover and when I saw this in a bookstore recently I had to get it. I mean not only is it feeding into my current fascination with nature books, nature writing, animals, illustrations, but the cover is just exquisite. I understand it was originally published in 2016 but it's been re-released this year in 2024 and it's by Mark Avery. It's a lovely small coffee table-ish kind of book and it's actually about, about 67 different species of birds broken down into categories. And the categories are things like songbirds, birds of prey, birds that are useful to us, birds in flight I think is another one, and it just gives like a page on each of the different birds. So this is one, birds that, the love life of birds, and it has some beautiful illustrations from the British Library Board and it just gives all these little tidbits about who what who they are what they're like a bit more about their origin and just the artwork is so rich and detailed that it is really such a beautiful book to go through and as you go through you start to see similar themes um, our connection with birds their connection their relationships it's really it's not too it's not deep um, it's just a really interesting little look into some remarkable birds. So I, I love this particular book. The next, I guess, anthology is uh, The Secret, Secret Voices, A Year of Women's Diaries, edited by Sarah Gristwood. And I came across this a while ago. I'm not sure how, but I saw it finally in a bookstore. And it's released by Batsford. And Batsford uh, releasing some bangers of these anthologies. There's some really, really great ones. I mean, they had all those, uh, you know, poems for a winter's night, a nature poem for every day of the year kind of stuff. And, and they're really starting to dig deep into specific genres. And this particular one are extracts of women's diaries, and it's done through a calendar year. So from the 1st of January all the way through to the 31st of December. Personally, this particular publication it's just hitting all the right notes, just the publication itself, not the contents, the uh, paper stock, the font, the colours. It's just such a pleasure to read. It is really, really lovely. It might be my favourite one so far of their anthologies, I think. So the contents themselves is really interesting. There's a lot of diarists that you would have heard of, like Anne Frank, Queen Victoria, uh, but there's also a lot of other people, uh, writers, actors, wives of very famous writers and there's a lot of voices I hadn't particularly heard of before but one thing that Sarah in her introduction mentions is that historically published diaries have been kind of segmented to middle and upper class white literate women. Something she wanted to do was to be much more inclusive so she sought out translations of uh, Asian women as well, or uh, perhaps women that didn't leave extraordinary lives, but nonetheless, they kept diaries of their day-to-day -day life. The back of this book has a little passage on each of the women, so you can read a little bit about who they are. It also has a complete reference at the back of the books that she's extracted these from, so you can dive further into the diaries if you want to. And it was really quite cool, like the 1st of January, <laughs> have this very um, interesting little entry from George Eliot's diary, which I thought was interesting. So this is the 1st of January. A bright frosty morning and we are both well. The servants are going to have their little treat and we are going to see Mr. and Mrs. Burne Jones and carry a book for their little boy. I have set myself many tasks for the year. I wonder how many will be accomplished. A novel called Middlemarch, a long poem on Timoleon and several minor poems. I mean, and Middlemarch, she just, just started writing it and wasn't sure what was gonna happen. 
you know, they're not all quite long, long entries. Quite, some are quite small, some are much more thoughtful. I'm really enjoying it, just diving into it. And from a historical perspective, it's quite fascinating to read about these different lives, like in the Napoleonic Wars, World War II, uh, just general life even. I think there was an entry I read recently from Virginia Woolf about giving the, the women got a vote and she wasn't going to write in her diary, but she was like, I need to document this in my diary today. I keep a journal myself and this is really encouraging me to stick at it. I'm, I'm not writing it for other people to read, but it is interesting that some of these diaries that these women wrote were intended for publication. Others were probably not. And it's leading me to many book recommendations, books that I want to pick up. In particular, there are a couple that I was umming and ahhing about for quite a while. And then I read some extracts in here from these particular women. So I decided to go ahead and buy those books. So I just ordered them this week and I actually decided to order the slightly foxed editions, which are really lovely. So they'll get here in a week or so's time. But the first book is Nella Last's War. Nella Last was a housewife in Barrow, I think, in England. And in 1939, there were these two men who decided to set up what was called the Mass Observation Archive. And this was inviting people from all walks of life within England to just di write diary entries about their everyday life. People volunteered to do this and then they would submit those writings to the archive. And this is the summary of Nella's diaries in particular around the war. When war broke out, Nella's youngest son joined the army while the rest of the family tried to adapt to civilian life. Writing each day for the mass observation project, Nella, a middle-aged housewife from the bombed town of Barrow, shows what people really felt during this time. This was a period in which she turned 50, saw her children leave home and reviewed her life and her marriage, which she eventually compares to slavery. Her growing confidence as a result of her work, war work makes this a moving, though often comic, testimony which covering sex, death, fear of invasion provides a new unglamorized female perspective on the war years. I think it's going to be an incredible glimpse into the life of an ordinary wife and mother and in particular trying to hold down those roles in such an uncertain time in wartime holding down the fort quite quite literally so that was the first one that i bought and the next one i decided to buy after reading secret voices was 84 charing cross road by helene hant and this was one on my wish list for a long time and it, it's actually my understanding is it is a series of letters as opposed to diary entries, really. It's a memoir, a memoir of friendship, of book lovers. And to my understanding, it's quite a classic. And this is a little bit of a summary. In 1949, Helene Hamp, a poor writer with an antiquitarian taste in books, wrote to Marks & Co booksellers of 84 Charing Cross Road in search of the rare editions she was unable to find in New York. Her books were dispatched with polite but brisk efficiency but seeking further treasures, Helene soon found herself in regular correspondence with bookseller Frank Dole, laying siege to his English reserve with her warmth and wit. And as letters, books and quips crossed the ocean, a friendship flourished that would endure for 20 years. So I, it's something I've wanted to read for a while and being able to read a couple of these excerpts from Secret Voices has really encouraged me to do that. I'm really enjoying diaries and letters and just... I think I'm coming into a non-fiction period where I really want to focus on that as we come into winter. But so those are a couple that I just bought this week. So this leads us into some fiction books that I bought. And the first few that I got was actually in a secondhand store when we were on holiday in Albany, which I shared in my last video. And we popped into this secondhand store, which was incredible. The, if, if I lived in Albany, I would be there very, very regularly. And I was wandering around, actually looking for a Colum Toy Bean book. I thought it was probably going to be there if it was anywhere. It wasn't, but I did find Winter Solstice by Rosamond Pilcher. And this has been on my wish list for a while. I've done a lot of digging around online looking for a nice edition. The new covers, I just don't love. They're just really blah, these contemporary covers. So I found this one. It's a hardback, which is beautiful. And the... When I was looking for um, a version like this online, it was quite expensive. I got this for $11, so I was stoked with that. So this is clearly a winter setting, winter solstice. I believe it's set around Christmas time, and it is a classic. The Rosamund Pilcher fans are quite evangelical about how amazing her books are. And by all accounts, this is a really heartwarming and uplifting story set around Christmas time in Scotland. 
So it's, I think it's going to be quite descriptive and really transport me there. And even though it's about Christmas, I'm probably going to read this soon. And then right next to that book, I saw The Shell Seekers by Rosamond Pilcher, again with this beautiful vintage cover. So The Shell Seekers uh, summary is, Artist's daughter Penelope Keeling can look back on a full and varied life, a bohemian childhood in London and Cornwall, an unhappy wartime marriage and the one man she truly loved. She has brought up three children and learned to accept each of them as they are. Yet she is far too energetic and independent to settle sweetly into pensioned off old age. And when she discovers that her most treasured possession, her father's painting, The Shell Seekers, is now worth a small fortune, it is Penelope who must make the decisions that will determine whether her family can continue to survive as a family or be split apart. So I think it's um, considered a classic. I believe this one was written in 1987 while Winter Solstice was in 2000. And I believe Winter Solstice was the last book that Rosamund Pilcher uh, published. I think she retired shortly after. But I'm really glad I got that. And then completely random, I came across this one, uh, The Mammoth Hunters by Jean M. Ayl. And I showed, I've talked about the Clan of the Cave Bear a few times, and I showed my collection of Clan of the Cave Bear books. And I kind of mentioned that I wanted to get the vintage covers. And so I saw this one and thought, why not? So I think I'm starting to collect these ones. And the this is the third in the series. It might be a struggle to try and get the last book or two in this edition, but I got it. Another classic and one to add to my growing children's classic collection is A Wrinkle in Time by Madeleine Lengel. And I, to be honest, had not heard of A Wrinkle in Time until I heard of the movie adaptation a few years ago. I haven't seen the movie, but I, I just kept coming across the book here and there in some things I was reading. So I thought I might give it a go. I believe it's the first of four books. I think it's called A Quintet, The Wrinkle, of, A Wrinkle in Time Quintet. Um, but it's written for middle grade schoolers. It is a science fiction fantasy slant, definitely. And it sounds like quite an adventure. So I am looking forward to it. The synopsis on the back was, it was a dark and stormy night. Out of this wild night, a strange visitor comes to the Murray house and beckons Meg, her brother Charles Wallace and their friend Calvin O'Keefe on a most dangerous and extraordinary adventure, one will, that will threaten their lives and our universe. And this was published a long time ago in the early 60s, I believe. So it's another one for my children's collection. So quite providentially, after I shared my last video with you, um, well, after I shared a video with you guys, the nature book tag, I spoke about a book by um, an Indigenous author called Leah Purcell. And the book was called The Drover's Wife. And the book was taken from a short story written by Henry Lawson called The Drover's Wife. Anyway, I'm wandering through the bookstore and I come across this book called The Story Thief by Kyra Geeds, Geddes. And this is again about the drover's wife short story. So let me read this synopsis. Fact and fiction meld into this stirring family saga set against shifting landscapes and pivotal moments in Australian history. Lillian was born in 1892, the same year Henry Lawson wrote The Drover's Wife and cemented his place in Australia's literary canon. When Lillian reads the story as a teenager, she is convinced that it is based upon her own family and becomes determined to prove it. But as the years pass, the truth becomes more problematic and Lillian must decide what is more important, holding on to the past or embracing the future. This is a, a debut novel. Uh, it was just released this year, but I thought it was kind of interesting that I had just been talking about the short story and now there's another inspired novel based on that short story. I'm not sure if you've noticed that there's a lot of books coming out with that kind of slant, that a supporting character is getting their own story or a retelling of it in some way or a, a prequel that the original author is not doing. So it's interesting that's happening more and more. Um, this one I thought was sounds really interesting and it's a debut novel. So I thought I'll give it a go. And then another fiction book I bought was The Tuesday Murder, sorry, The Tuesday Club Murders by Agatha Christie. And I saw this really lovely hardback edition in the store and thought it was a lovely little one. So I understand this was called um, The 13 Problems in the US when it was released. And it was released in, you know, the early 30s. But it's a, it's a collection of short stories. And my understanding is that uh, a group of people congregate at Miss Marple's house 
I think, and um, they end up forming this club, their Tuesday Club Murders, where they all bring a problem or a murder or a mystery and they try and figure out the answer. And, of course, Jane Marple is smarter than everybody in the world and so I'm looking forward to reading this one and it is short stories so it's a uh, quite a nice one I think for you know on a quiet cold night and this one I really don't need to talk about much at all because it's on everybody's wish list TBR just read um, but I did recently pick this up in the bookstore this is James by Percival Everett and this is another retelling or inspired novel based on the adventures of Huckleberry Finn James is Jim, who is the slave that is travelling with Huckleberry Finn up the Mississippi. And this is Percival Everett's retelling of that story from James's perspective. And it sounds like a really interesting idea. I think Percival Everett's writing is quite legendary. I have not read any of his books, but I'm looking forward to reading this one. So I finally got it, saw it in the bookstore and decided to get it. And then the last fiction book I have is A Single Man by Christopher Isherwood. I was not seeing it on bookstores when I went in there, you know, physical bookstores, and then I kind of found it online. And I really loved this little edition. It was really sweet. So this is a classic and it's set in 1960s California. It's about a man named George who is a gay, middle-aged English professor, and he's just lost his partner who has died tragically. And this is set over a 24 hour period where George goes about his usual routine, but he's doing it after his partner has passed away. And I think there's a lot of uh, elements of you know, grief and uh, societal things as well coming into it considering the 1960s. Um, but it sounds, it sounds like a really beautiful story. I think it's gonna be quite touching. And once I finish this, I'm looking forward to finally watching uh, the movie adaptation with Colin Firth and I think Julianne Moore. And I believe it was directed by Tom Ford. It was a while ago, but it got some really good acclaim. So I'm looking forward to reading that one. And I really do love the little cover. So now I'm coming into some nonfiction books. And the first one I have is Scotland, Scotland's Forgotten Past, A History of Mislaid, Misplaced and Misunderstood by Alastair Moffat. And it's a really lovely little edition that I have started reading. Like I said, I'm kind of coming into my nonfiction era for winter. I'm leaning towards memoirs and these anthologies and these non-fiction books and I think that's just where I'm kind of going for winter. So this one sounds really interesting. Scotland's unique in its history telling because a lot of Scotland's history is tied up with England, tied up with other countries. So this I thought would be quite interesting to learn a bit more about Scotland. And it doesn't just give a, it doesn't just talk about, you know, the usual kings and queens and rebels of Scotland. It's trying to give a voice to unknown stories, maybe people that we haven't heard about. And I think it does say that even as, you know, the most knowledgeable Scot may not know about some of these people or stories. And the, the next story I'm reading is called The Cave of Headless Children. So I don't know what that's going to be about, but I need to find a quiet spot and not be disturbed for at least 15 minutes while I read that story. And the next one I've got is a memoir again, and this is my, I'm a sucker for a cover book again, because look how beautiful it is. This is The Year of Sitting Dangerously, My Garden Safari by Simon Barnes. And this is a really cool idea. I really love the idea of this one. It's, an, it's a memoir from Simon Barnes, and the idea came from, uh, in 2020, he was due to go on safari in Zambia. And like the rest of the world, he went into lockdown because of COVID, so he could not go on safari. So this is what came out of it. In the autumn of 2020, when the COVID pandemic put a stop to his safari in Zambia, Simon Barnes embarked on the only voyage of discovery still open to him or to anyone else for that matter. He put down a chair at the bottom of his garden and sat down. His itinerary to sit in the same spot every day for a year and to see and hear what happened all around. It would be a stationary garden safari with specific rules set. You must keep still, not look at your phone and let nature set the agenda. And then it goes over 12 months of him doing this. He's sitting in sunshine, sitting in blizzards, sitting in rain. And I just, it sounds fascinating. So I'm looking forward to it. It is written again in a calendar year. Uh, so I guess you could pot potentially go through it like an anthology, but I think I'll just read it like a, um, like a little bit of a book, but it, it just, what a great idea. Next I have My Brilliant Career by Miles Franklin. And this is fiction 
but it is also considered to be non-fiction. It's supposed to be quite liberal in the sense that it's taken a lot from Miles Franklin's own life. So, you know, decide what you will, whether it's fiction or non-fiction, but she, she did not want it to be seen as an autobiography, that's for sure, based on all of her comments after it was published. I shared with you in a little mini haul, I think in March, that I bought a book called My Brilliant Sister. And that book was a another retelling of um, a character in Miles Franklin's life who is Miles Franklin's sister. I, I asked you guys, should I read My Brilliant Career first before I read that one? And you, you said yes. So I decided to get it. Miles Franklin is one of Australia's most famous writers, most definitely. And it's rather good timing out that I got this because the Miles Franklin long list for 2024 was just released last week. So I know a lot of you are looking to read some of those books in preparation for the winner announcement. I want to read this one because I want to learn a little more about Miles Franklin, the woman. And I did share about the Miles Franklin Award itself in, in that video where I shared that book with you. So I'll share a link to that video uh, so you can go find out a bit more about the award. And this is what this book is about. When 16 year old Miles Franklin began writing a thinly disguised novel about her youth in the Australian bush, she meant to show just how ridiculous the life around me would be as story material. But when my brilliant career was published in 1901, it struck its author's native country like a small bomb and so scandalised Australians that Franklin demanded that it not be published again until 10 years after her death. Today it remains electrifying for its passion, candour and contrariness. I'm looking forward to reading it, to learning a little bit more about her writing and then probably trying to dive into a couple of the long list books, which there are a few I've bookmarked or earmarked that I want to get to. And the next one I have is The Farmer's Wife by Helen Rebanks. This was on my, I, I don't know where I came across it, but it's been on my virtual TBR for a few months. I must have come across like a, you know, release list or whatever. And then I was listening to the Slightly Fox podcast recently about Adrian Bell and it kind of went down this rabbit hole of other uh, authors and farmers who had published work and Helen's husband James Rebanks is a farmer and an author and he's had quite a quite a few popular books come out in England about farming and about um, environmentalism I think to a certain extent but this is Helen's first book and it's a memoir about keeping a home, raising a family, and a little bit of farm work, I'm sure, in between. There's recipes in, amongst the memoirs. I think it's set over a day. Yeah, so the contents is um, dawn, morning, afternoon, late afternoon, and evening, and then there's like recipes scattered throughout. And it's a little illustrated as well. So this is the summary. A portrait of life at Helen Rebank's Lake District farmhouse that beautifully captures the unsung work of keeping a home and raising a family. Weaving past and present, Helen shares the days that have shaped her. This beautifully illustrated memoir takes place across one day at the farm, offers a chance to think about where our food comes from and who puts it on the table. Helen's recipes, lists and gentle wisdom help get us through our days, whatever they throw at us. And I, I fully respect homemakers. I, I actually really put a lot of value in how I keep my home, how I cared for my family and I... I think I'm really going to enjoy it from that perspective. It's not thankless work, but it is often hidden work. I think people don't realise that there is a lot of work that goes, I mean, it's called housework, right? It's a, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And I'm, I'm looking forward to reading this one most definitely. And it's, she's on a farm, she's in England, yes. And then this is the last one I have, which is Agatha Christie by Lucy Worsley. I've been wanting to get this for a while and I have not been able to find it on the shelf, but here we go. Lucy Worsley, I love. I love watching, there's a lot of documentaries that she does. She is a engaging historian. And the ones I, the, the things I have seen her do so far have been mainly about the monarchy, you know, King Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth I, that kind of stuff. But uh, she has got such a great reputation as a biographer. She is so engaging. She puts things into really interesting and captivating language. Um, and I want to learn more about Agatha Christie. She is someone who I think we think we know because of her books, but I, th I think there's definitely a, I think she's going to be a different kind of woman than I expected. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I, I, that's my little haul. That's what I've got going on at the moment. I've got some books to do. I got some reading to do. And thank you for joining me on this uh, little journey. I hope you got some recommendations of books out of this, whether it's a classic or a new book, Australian or otherwise. 
And I will definitely leave a link to the video where I talk about Miles Franklin a little bit in a little bit more detail and about the Miles Franklin Award. Uh, so you know a little bit more about that history. So please jump over and have a look at that. But in the meantime, I hope you have a lovely weekend ahead of you and I will see you again next week. Bye.